microprocessors, bell-bottom jeans, transistors, computer chips, AE1. This was the mid-70s to early 80s. Money was flowing, strong middle classes in Western countries and Japan left a little bit of disposable income to let millions purchase new things that interested them. Along comes the AE-1, the first genuinely mainstream camera that used microprocessor technology to provide new features at an inexpensive price. There were other cameras with microprocessors before it, but they're hardly comparable to the AE-1 regarding sales or long-term impact. Since its release in 1976, cameras have become increasingly electrified, evolving into fully automatic autofocus cameras and shifting away from film entirely. Now, camera companies like Minolta, oops, I mean Sony, use machine learning and AI to detect things like planes, trains, and plantains. I mean, at this rate, it's a matter of months until Canon leapfrogs the industry to introduce a camera that divorces your wife for you. I mean, getting an AI to do it is pretty impressive. It really skips the ambiguity of spending your money on cameras until they divorce you. Talk about a productivity time saver. The Canon AE-1 is in many ways the camera that started us on the road to where that technology is now. So, does the Canon AE-1 live up to its legend, or was its success a minor glitch in the system? The AE-1 is made out of plastics, but this ain't no for sure price. Canon was not playing around when they were strategically replacing formerly metal parts, even the small internal ones, with what I guess you could call microplastics. Rest assured, even if this thing breaks, its pieces will be floating around in the environment for thousands of years after you're long decomposed. The bottom plate is still brass. Nine out of 10 monkeys would guess that most of this camera is made out of metal, except for the bits where it obviously isn't, like the film crank, for example. It's a little bit flimsy and cheap feeling. The camera overall feels nice in the hand, and like most things of the era, kinda looks like a Ferrari Testarossa. It's got that real nice shine to its plastics that reminds you that it is proudly a product of modernity, but ironically, a relic of the past. Ooh, how tantalizing. Plastics are cheap to produce, light, and durable. When used in tech, there's a subtext of cheapness, and depending on the level of reflectivity, gaudiness. But we now live in a world where brands that might have previously tried to differentiate themselves from the pores by using only the most unethically harvested, rare animal furs now look to plastic and other synthetic materials to subvert the idea of what quality and avant-garde mean. And in that context, the AE-1's plastics might have been considered merely a cost-cutting strategy at the time, but have weirdly come back to be fashionable, and in some contexts, a statement today. The subtle curves of the Canon logo font let you know that this is a big old brand with pedigree and a whole lot of money. The partially italicized AE-1 font looks cool and futuristic and like a dumbass thing to name your child. Like, I mean, come on, man. Like, really? Be reasonable. I think you'll know better. The AE-1 is aesthetically supreme. Almost my platonic ideal of what a 35 millimeter film camera should look like. It is the past and the future all wrapped up and satisfyingly functional materials. It also kind of looks like a Testarossa. You 
this thing sold like hotcakes, like cocaine in the 80s. In fact, I wonder how many Wall Street dudes bought this camera while they were on a bender and just like going through the whole catalog of Pump and Dump Weekly before getting back to their coloring books or whatever business types do to wind down. It really does have staying power, except if you spill a cup of water on it and short circuit its five transistors, in which case it's staying broke because you probably cannot fix this thing. And it'd be cheaper to just buy another anyways. I digress. One reason this thing was marketed to beginners is that all the little circuits in an angled head enabled shutter priority auto exposure, which lets you set the shutter speed and then it will open or close the aperture of your lens to correct the exposure. So it functions kind of like your eyes do, automatically adapting to the environment around you by widening or narrowing your pupil or the aperture blades. Unlike your eyes, the automatically set aperture can make focusing more difficult. Your human brain takes care of this for you, but the Canon AE-1 is manual focus, and we can all be a little shit at that sometimes. Me personally, I've gotten used to focusing in the rangefinder style, where you take a shot, that kind of shot, then flip a coin, and if it lands on heads, you zone focus. If it lands on tails, you focus the rangefinder way with a box and whatnot. And then your subject moves and you end up zone focusing anyways. But you still rarely miss focus, even though it really shouldn't work. My photos on the Canon AE-1 are less focused than me in the back row of my junior year Algebra 2 classroom playing paper football. I somehow missed focus even whenever I took the time to focus. First and foremost, skill issue, I mean, come on, I need to get good. But also, using a wide aperture lens on this camera and a decent shutter speed means that more often than not, the camera is going to be opening up that nice wide aperture to get your film some more light. And you may think you're good at focusing, and I'm sure you are, you're great at focusing. But the margin of error is slim, and as somebody with steady hands, and astigmatism in both eyes, I would prefer aperture priority. The AE-1 offers a pretty banal set of specifications. I read a few other reviews in preparation for this video to get the general sentiment around this SLR, and one reviewer pointed out its relatively simplistic feature list, noting its lack of video. It's not exactly what I felt the camera was missing, but fascinating point. I want to study your brain in a lab. Flash sync to 1 60th of a second, bulb, 2 second to 1 1,000th of a second shutter speed range. The shutter is a bog standard horizontal cloth plane focal shutter, and it's pretty loud, it sounds like this. Those lovely little microplastics are also light. It comes in at about 590 grams. Its viewfinder has 94% coverage, which is pretty solid. I think I'll give it an A. And it can use a smorgasbord of different batteries. All right, Editor Drew here, just to let you guys know that um, this is all cap. Uh, the Canon A1 can use the 4LR44 or 4SR44 six volt battery. I'm not sure if the 4LR44 could be replaced with 4LR44s or not, but anyways, this is wrong. Those are the batteries that you can use and they're cheap, so nice. This camera also has a battery check button self timer and light, shutter lock, film rewind button and knob, tripod mount point and ISO adjustment dial. I do not like the ISO adjustment dial on this camera and many other cameras for that matter. In fact, I would go as far to say that I dislike it. I think camera designers just go out of their way to make these slightly annoying to operate, like just go the right way, you know? The focus screen is a split prism encircled by a micro prism focusing aid. It is a conventional and safe design. In comparison with my M6, it goes back and forth for which one is more useful in each situation. The split finder works by aligning the top and bottom half of what you're trying to focus on, which I find is sometimes more complicated than just overlapping the two ghosts of an object with a rangefinder camera. The micro prisms that border the split prism also give you an idea of whether the image is in focus by provide something that I would liken to like analog focus peaking. Overall, for a newcomer to photography, the AE-1 is easier to focus purely by virtue of being an SLR, where you can literally just see with your eyes whether or not something is in focus. 
The key feature of the AE1 non-program is the shutter speed priority mode, which works precisely as advertised and unseats manual operation as the primary mode by doing away with the information that you would want to have for manual operation. It isn't unusable manually, but like hemorrhoids, it makes doing simple things like sitting down, or in this case, getting the proper exposure, a pain in the ass. The AE1 does not have any indication of its light meter reading in the viewfinder besides a needle indicating exposure on a vertical list of aperture values. It is perfect for shutter priority where you already know your shutter speed and you just need to optimize for the aperture value. For manual operation, you want to know is it too dark, is it too bright, or information about what your aperture and shutter speed currently are or where they need to be. You will not find any of that here. You do get a nice little blinking M to remind you that you're making a mistake by trying to operate this camera manually. I'm being dramatic for effect, but this camera's light meter is objectively not very useful for manual operation. For comparison, the Leica M6 gives you a relative approach to light metering and literally directs you in the way to go to fix your exposure. The Nikon F3 gives you the same information, plus your current shutter speed and aperture and provides even more utility in its auto exposure modes. I like a minimalistic experience, but the AE-1 reduces information in the wrong ways, and for that, its versatility suffers. Image quality is entirely dependent on the film stock and a lens that you choose to put on your camera. I bought the AE-1 for about 80 US dollars, and the FD 50mm f1.4 came out to more than double that at around $200. This honestly says more about how inexpensive the body is than how expensive the lens is. 50mm f1.4 is about as standard as it comes for this type of SLR film camera, and I tested my f3 with the Nikon equivalent of the same lens when I reviewed it. It's a great little lens and it bends light real nice. The depth of field at f1.4 is fiendishly thin, which honestly, considering that I don't take portraits that often, is a bit of a turnoff for me. Don't kill me. But it is just gorgeous. The bokeh has that nice swirly quality to it that makes everything look as if it's seen through the eyes of somebody who just shotgunned a beer. I think for $300 for this combo of camera and lens, most people would be extremely satisfied with the results. I love walking around with them, and it's only half because they make me look sexy. The Canon FD lens mount offers a wide array of lenses for you to choose from. You can purchase every basic lens that you would want to. Wide angle, standard focal length, telephoto, zoom, etc. There are even specialty lenses like tilt shift, macro, and fisheye. You could even buy a radioactive lens for this system. That is, if you're willing to pay out a few thousand on the used market for it. They have a reputation for being quality lenses sharp, fast, smooth focus rings, all the good stuff. And they're typically less expensive than Nikon lenses. That's due to Canon phasing out the FD mount to move to the EF mount so they could put autofocus in their cameras. Nikon, on the other hand, essentially kept the same mount until the release of their mirrorless cameras and the Z mount. There is some criticism of the mounting mechanism on FD lenses, but in my very limited experience, it seems fine. Although it is a little bit weird to have to press a button on the lens and not on the camera to demount the lens. In short, the lenses are great, and compared just to Nikon, inexpensive. I think most photographers tend to only use one lens on their cameras, but for power users, this makes FD mount cameras like the AE-1 really attractive. I disagree with the sentiment that this is a good beginner's camera. Every time I put my eye to the viewfinder, it hurts me a little to see the lack of useful exposure information. If you're a beginner, or even if you're not, who cares, you can and should use automatic features if you want to. However, the cost of automatic features in the Canon AE-1 is that the camera is centered around the shutter priority use case in its design. The shutter priority mode is fast, accurate, and effective. But one mode is not the best way to improve your analog photography skills, if that's something that you care about. I've never used the other versions of the AE-1, which there are a few of. My understanding is that they are largely identical except with mildly different grips and different types of auto exposure modes. I would probably prefer the program mode of the AE-1 program, real on the nose there with the naming scheme, 
But that doesn't really affect my opinion on the camera's overall functionality much because shopping through the AE1 catalog is like shopping for different colored strafe jackets. It may be a different color, but you still can't move or you still can't have the information to properly expose in manual. I kid, but there are better user experiences for those looking to learn manual photography that provide you with more information to acclimate you to the process of finding the correct exposure. The camera also has a few other flaws that you should know about. The E1 does not have interchangeable focus screens, depth of field preview, does not work at all without batteries, and the battery door is a little bit fragile. So as I was finishing recording the video on the Canon A1, I realized another thing that it's missing, and that is exposure compensation. Exposure compensation, especially on a camera like this, which is auto exposure, primarily auto exposure. It's centered around shutter speed priority auto exposure. A feature like exposure compensation is especially important. So let's say that there's a bright light on somebody's face, and your reading you know is going to be uh, too high of an exposure to expose correctly for their, for their skin tone or the opposite way around. Somebody's face is gonna be like a little bit dark or maybe they have a darker skin tone and you want to adjust the exposure to account for that. You're not gonna be able to do this on this camera and that in combination with the lack of proper information in the viewfinder for manual operation is going to make that a little bit problematic for some photographers. Personally, I was out shooting the other night in uh, Dogenzaka and I was like, okay, I only have 400 ISO film it would be great if I could just shoot my shots underexposed. It's going to look not ideal, but I'd rather have the you know extra 15th of a second, 30th of a second of shutter speed to make sure that my shots are actually sharp and in focus, or you know the extra stop on the aperture, etc., rather than the you know, extra stop of exposure. But you don't get to make that choice on this camera. I want to talk a little bit about film photography and money because I think it needs to be acknowledged that film photography is a remarkably expensive hobby. I understand why many photographers of a certain age scoff at the recent resurgence of film because for them digital was and is the future. Because the expensive part of film photography is not the camera, it's the film. If you shoot 10 rolls of film, the film developing and scanning, which a beginner in particular will not be doing themselves, will easily surpass the cost of the camera. This does not mean that it is not worthwhile to shoot film on inexpensive cameras. I've very happily shot rolls of film through cameras that cost less than the single roll of film itself. However, if you're a particularly compulsive consumer, then the AE-1's limitations may irk you and you may end up buying another camera soon after. The AE-1 is a lovely little camera. I honestly feel a little bit of a bond with it after only using it for a short while. It may be a mass manufactured piece of technology for the consumer market, but those transistors got a little bit of soul in them. It's not my favorite camera. And as I've spoken on, I have criticisms from the somewhat obnoxious stance that I'm obliged to take as a quote unquote reviewer. The viewfinder does not give you a lot of information. It doesn't work without batteries at all. It seems a common occurrence for the battery door to just break off. It doesn't have interchangeable focus screens. If you drop it or get it wet, it may be a goner. The Canon AE-1 does not live up to the hype, but the hype is never real. And the Canon AE-1 will record every moment that matters to you. I really appreciate you guys watching this video. If you want to support my channel, then you can head down below the video and hit the like button. And if you really enjoyed the video, then please subscribe. And yeah, that's it. I'm signing out from Kanda Jinja in Akihabara. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one.